Hello folks, it is Wednesday evening again, the 4th of November, and we're going to come and study Hebrews again. As we do so, let's just pause first of all and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you again this Wednesday as we come to look at your word. Thank you again for your constant presence with us. Lord, for many people it's been a week of ups and downs. In the last few weeks maybe have been quite difficult. But we thank you that you're always with us. As the children head back to school, Lord, we continue to pray for them, asking you to look after them and protect them. And Lord, for those whose businesses are still closed, that you would just draw alongside them as well and just help them to know that you're with them. Lord, as we come to look at your word this evening, just still and settle our hearts, we pray. Open us, open our minds and our hearts to you. And again, Lord, as always, we pray that you would encourage us and uphold us but also challenge us. So Lord, we thank you now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, let me read to you, first of all, the first 12 verses of Hebrews chapter 6. That's what it says, New Living Translation. So let us stop going back over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instructions about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit. You have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again, and holding him up to public shame. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field, and burn it. Dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we don't really believe it applies to you. We are confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for others, other believers, as you still do. Our great, great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the examples of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. Amen. If you can remember last week, it finished off by talking about how an infant needs milk, uh, but then as you mature, how you need more mature food. And the challenge to us was to become mature in our faith. It's not maturity of age, but maturity of faith. Um, there are many people who are young of age, but who have a more mature faith and, and vice versa. So again, Hebrews chapter 6 starts off by challenging us, challenging us with that maturity. So let us not stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to go for the basic teachings. It's easy to just look at what they say. Um, it's harder to go deeper. It requires us to take time and effort to think about things for ourselves, to put in the hard work of understanding. And maybe we're just not prepared for that. Maybe we just like a nice simple message Something which we can go, yeah, yeah, I agree with that, and then move on to something else. That's not being mature in our faith. That's not having solid food. That's just having the milk, as the writer put it last week. Um, but we need to strive towards that solid food. The writer goes on to say in, ver in that for opening verse, let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. You know, in... Matthew chapter 28, Jesus didn't say to his disciples in the Great Commission, go and make believers or go and make Christians. 
he said, go and make disciples. Now, you've got to look at the meaning of that word disciple and all that comes with that. It's somebody who takes on the teaching of somebody else, who takes on the belief of somebody else. Someone who strives to, to learn and to grow in that teaching. And Jesus said before in his own time, you know, that his yoke was light. Um, that, his, that his teachings weren't a burden. But they're still the teachings that we need to learn and understand and challenge ourselves with. So that we become mature in our understanding. The writer goes on in that verse says, Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repeating from evil deeds. Or another way of translating that, the, the, those words evil deeds is dead works. I, and then it's, it finishes off the verse by saying, I'm placing our faith in God. He, he is just putting down a mark and said, just remember, it's not about what you do. It's about your faith. It's not about um, helping somebody whenever they need help. It's not about um, looking out for those who can't look out for themselves. It's not about um, that, that little old lady who needs a helping hand across the road or somebody who needs their groceries brought in or somebody who needs their car washed or the grass cut. It's not about the like of that. It's not about being a good person. And yes, we, we should be good and we need to be good. But it's about faith. So even though the writer says, let's not go over it time and time again, he still lays down that challenge, placing our faith in God. He goes on to say, you don't need further instructions about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These are some of the things which are seen as being basic and fundamental. Um, it says you don't need further instructions about baptisms. And there's, a, and there's a plural there and, and even thinking about the word baptism and what does it mean um, in itself the word baptism means immersion or to go down yeah. and, and we quite often think about baptism in a pool or in a sea or in a lake and we think about that but when you start to, to dig into that word baptism and you start to look at the other reference for baptism in the bible even start with what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist said about, I baptise with water, but there's one coming who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. Talking about Jesus. And that's a challenge even in itself. Because then it's like, well, what does that baptism mean? Is baptism receiving the Holy Spirit? And when do I receive the Holy Spirit? You know, the disciples received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. You have all examples where the believers pray for people to receive the Spirit and they do, but then that, that disappears in the New Testament. And there's then the assumption that comes through that our baptism, um, like Jesus says, you know, like the different writers should believe and be baptised. Uh, it, it's that sense of that whenever we open our lives in faith to God and we receive the Holy Spirit, it, that's a baptism. Um, and, then, and then obviously within our church as well, it's a promise of baptism for our covenant theology that we bring our children as, 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 as people of faith. We bring our children um, asking that God would teach them, would challenge them, that they would put their own faith in God. But we believe our children, um, we believe that that's the right thing that we should do. You know, it, it evolves from... Uh, circumcision in the Old Testament whenever um, the male children were circumcised we bring all our children whenever we are believers for, for baptism within our church uh, and ask that God would work in their lives we know that baptism in itself that doesn't make that child a believer it doesn't make them a Christian but it, it's through the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives that they will hopefully open themselves up to God you know so Whenever we think about baptism, we think about all of that. It talks about the laying on of hands. You know, when somebody's called to position within the church, it talks about laying on of hands and praying. It also talks about laying on of hands when somebody is ill and the elders coming and praying for that person and laying on of hands. You know, how we, we see that laying on of hands as an extension of what Christ did. Whenever Christ laid hands on people for healing and we, we pray asking for healing, 
we pray asking for God's anointing on people. We pray um, just asking that they would follow through. You know, we talk about the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead. We believe that whenever Jesus comes back, we'll be raised from the dead. And it's that teaching and eternal judgment. We believe as well that there is a price to be paid if we don't follow God. And that's eternal judgment. You know, so the writer lays them down as fundamentals, as basics. You've been taught about these things. You know what these things are. So get on with it, he's basically saying. And verse 3 actually says, And so God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. You know, we want God to open up our eyes to further understanding. We want God to teach us more about what it is to be his child, what it is to follow him and to believe in him. But that requires us to put in effort. We are lazy people. We like to be spoon fed. We like someone to tell us what to believe. Um, we like to pick up a set of Bible notes and read one or two verses and then read away the explanation. Ah, that's great, and put it back down again. That's not really growing in understanding. That's not moving forward to further understanding as the writer puts it here. Moving forward to further understanding requires us to study God's word, to look at it, to look at how it links together, to look at how all those connections are meant to be, to look at the big picture of God's word. And that takes effort. You know, the, the writer here gives a warning. It gives a warning about falling away uh, and what that means. It says it's impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It's impossible to bring such people back to repentance. We don't bring people to repentance in the first place. It's not us who's doing the work. Yes, God uses us. God uses us as the tool, as the medium, um, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit. We talk about being convicted by the Holy Spirit, being challenged by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And then whenever we have opened our life to God, about how the Holy Spirit helps us to understand God's word. And the one sin which the Bible lists as being as unforgivable is grieving the Holy Spirit denying the work of the Holy Spirit. And the, the writer here pretty much gives out warning. You know, if, if, if at one time you follow God and you say it and then you've turned your back and said he doesn't exist and the Holy Spirit doesn't exist, he says you, you're, it's like nailing him, that's Jesus, to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. You know, he says that's what you're basically doing. You're denying Christ. You're nailing him to the cross. And we shouldn't be doing that. And then it comes with another two verses of warning. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears swords and thistles, it is useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. Yeah, that's judgment. That's the judgment of God if, if we are a field of thorns instead of a, a field where there's a good crop. It's sad, isn't it? People turn their backs on God all the time, reject him. They try to explain him away. We forget who God is. But the writer says to these people who are reading this letter in Hebrews, Dear friends, even though we're talking this way, we don't really believe it applies to you. We are confident that you're meant for better things, things that come with salvation. So it seems that these Christians who they're writing to, these believers, are young in their faith and they want to encourage them to keep on reading God's word, to keep on growing, to keep, to keep firm, to keep the faith, as we say, to keep striving forwards to study and to learn and to know, really know what it means to be a follower of God. It says, for God is not unjust. 
he will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers. Or the other way of interpreting believers is God's holy people, as you still do. So salvation is not about good works, it's about faith. But whenever we have that faith, then it should change our works. It should change our actions. And it talks then about working hard for God. Do you ever read in the Bible where Jesus' followers get it easy? Do you ever read where they don't face persecution? Um, do you ever read where people welcome them with open arms and no reservations? No. It's always hard. It's always difficult. Because the message that God's people bring is counter to the culture. Put others first. Think of yourself last. Give to God before you give to yourself. And because of that teaching, it's hard. So, yes, living for God is not easy. It's very challenging. But listen to verse 11. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain of what you hope for will come true. Then you, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the examples of those who are going to inherit God's promise, promises because of their faith and endurance. There is an inheritance waiting for us. Not an inheritance that you think of in earthly terms, where somebody might leave you something funny in a will, you know, something, a knick-knack from their house, or they might leave you some money, or they might even leave you that house itself. But those disappear quickly, don't they? Money gets spent, houses come to rack and ruin or get sold on, knick-knacks get forgotten about. The writer's talking about building an inheritance in heaven. How that whenever we live for God here on earth, the reward that we will receive in heaven for doing that. And that's about being spiritually mature. You know, if, if we're immature, we're not really serving. We're just learning and we're feeding off others. Whereas when we become mature, then we are teaching others, feeding others. We're living the life the way we should do. Um, we're living it out, living our faith day by day. And by doing that, we are building up for ourselves an inheritance in heaven. And one day, when we go to be in heaven, we will receive that inheritance or that gift or that reward from God, whatever you want to call it. And we'll be amazed by what God gives us. We've, we have no idea what nature that will take or what it will be like. But we will be amazed. But that's what we're striving towards. We should be striving here on earth to serve God as much as possible. To serve him in the fullness that we can. Not in a half-hearted way. So that we can receive and fill our reward in heaven. How do you feel today? Do you feel like a child, like a baby? Do you feel like you're wobbling on your feet? You can't really take one step after another? Or are you a bit more confident on your feet? Are you confident maybe even to, to run and follow God? To run that race for him and to do your very best because that's what he calls us to do. Let's pray right now, that God would give each of us that confidence. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the challenges of your word. Lord, the challenge to run the race for you, the challenge to be confident for you, to be mature for you, to not to keep going over the basics, but to dig deeper into our faith. Father, help us to do that. Help us to want to spend time with you. Help us to want to spend time in your word, learning it, knowing it, being encouraged by it, being told off by it, being corrected by it, being brought close to you through your word. Lord, for the challenges that we face the rest of this week, we surrender ourselves to you and ask that you would simply be with us and guide us and direct us. And in the week that lies ahead, that, Father, we would look for the opportunities to really serve you 
and to be mature for you. Father, thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening, folks. I trust that you would know God's peace and God's blessing. Take care. See you next week. Bye.